Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to our weekly investor forum. I'm your host, Dan Theok, Senior Vice President of Investment Banking here at Mayberry Investments Limited. I'll be joined today by our Executive Chairman, Christopher Bear Online, and our CEO, Gary Parrott. Our special guest speaker for this evening will be Gordon Swaby, CEO and co-founder of Edufoco Limited. We encourage our viewers to post their questions on social media and to remember to tag us with the hashtag MIL Investor Forum. If you enjoyed this program, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll also be featuring a market segment on foreign exchange, so be sure to stick around until the end of the program. Edufoco Limited is a Jamaican education technology company. Since 2012, Edufocal has been servicing schools and companies with its innovative learning platform and e-courses. Currently, over 100,000 parents have trusted Edufocal to prepare their students for their grade 6 achievement test, now called the primary exit profile. Impressively, Edufocal's investments in technology has led to it becoming one of the top 100 ed tech companies in the Latin American and Caribbean region in 2021, according to Holland IQ. Lastly, the company made yet another major move by listing on the Jamaica Stock Exchange earlier this month, and we expect it to actually start trading within the next two weeks. I take this moment to remind you that if you are seeking to expand your portfolio or embark on your very first investment journey, Mayberry Investments can guide you in achieving your financial goals. Follow us on social media and visit our website at www.mayberryinv.com to learn more. Our social media handles should pop up somewhere on the screen. Now I'd like to introduce you to our special guest for this evening, CEO Gordon Swaby, co-founder of Edifocal, founded the company in 2010. Gordon's work with Edufocal and in the education sector in Jamaica has received international acclaim. In 2016, the BBC recognized Edufocal and Gordon as digital disruptors and created a short documentary film which aired on BBC's networks. Gordon's work in the education sector has also been recognized locally. He's the recipient of the prestigious Governor General's Award. Gordon is a director of various public sector organizations, including the Jamaica Library Service and eLearning Jamaica Limited. Today, Gordon will be giving an investor update on Edufocal and telling us about his journey to going public. Welcome, Gordon. Thanks for being with us. Dan, thank you for having me. And thanks, Gary, for being with us online. So, Gordon, we wanted to talk a little bit today about your journey to going public. Uh, I don't think everybody appreciates the hard effort and work that goes on in the background. Mm -hmm. They just see your prospectus, that it's being done by Mayberry, that you sell off in one minute, that you were trying to raise $130 million, and you were oversubscribed some four or five times to the extent that the general public pool has only been allocated 10,000 shares each, plus a pro rata of about 16.57% in terms of the basis of allotment. <coughs> so tell us, Gordon, this, this didn't start you know, yesterday, or, or even a year ago, or even two years ago. T tell us a bit about the journey to going public, and what it's taken, and, and how you felt about it, and, and how you feel today. So Dan, you know, I have to start by being grateful and showing gratitude to the many parties and stakeholders that were involved and have been involved in this process. You know, um, my team, my board, Mayberry Investments Limited, um, so many people have been involved in this process. My parents, my wife, you know, even my son, even my 18-month-old son has been a key part um, in this process. But Dan, if I was to talk about the entire history or the entire arc of Edifocal, it would take the entire forum. So. I think a good place to start um, would be the fact that I've been a Mayberry client for about five to six years. I remember um, trying to get a Mayberry account and you know, there was a $1 million um, requirement. <laughs> uh, I didn't have that $1 million at the time, but I was able to convince one of the um, sales reps to, to, to get me an account. Anyway, I share that story because um, I was invited, or I tagged along with a friend of mine, Kirk Anthony Hamilton about two and a half years ago to a Mayberry Investor Forum. So it was right before the pandemic. And I was um, reintroduced to a Christopher Berry. Um, this, is, this was February 2020. And you know, I was just telling Chris about 
what Eddie Focal is, where we're going, some of the things we have in the pipeline, and he was seemingly interested. Took my number, um, I, he you know, gave me his number, and the day, you know, a day later I called him just to kind of bounce something off him, and he, he made an offer over WhatsApp to buy a stake in Eddie Focal, and he told me that I had until the end of the day yeah. <laughs> to, to, to accept the offer, and that he would not negotiate on his offer. Um, <clears throat> Saying yes to Chris and that investment is one of the best decisions I've ever made um, for Edufocal. And you know, that initial investment started a series of events that has led us here. Um, for me, there's no better partner than Mayberry. In fact, about five, six years ago, you know, I made a tweet saying that you know, Mayberry lists the companies that matter, which I, I mean, I think is a fact. But the point is, um, that started the journey and it's been a long journey. Um, I certainly went in, went in thinking that I was ready to list at the time, this was 2020, but I was nowhere near ready to list and um, yourself, Gary, Chris, um, walked me through the entire process and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a different person, Eddie Focal is a better company for it. And we believe that listing now within, you know, over the next couple of quarters, our investors will see, in my opinion, an outsized return on, on their investment. So I also want to say thank you to the, the, the many shareholders that you know, put faith in us, put faith in the company, and have invested in Edufocal. I believe that, um, as you mentioned earlier, we were looking for $130 million, and we, we, about, we got about $415 million in subscriptions. And I think if we opened or kept the, 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 the IP open even longer, we'd have gotten to a billion dollars. No doubt, no doubt. In fact, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> we, we had to make that decision because it was clear that the floodgates were absolutely were, were, are about to open and if we didn't close them quickly we would have frustrated a lot of investors who wanted to get in on the transaction. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been 16.5 percent <laughs> for that it would have been like one percent. Five percent if you're lucky. Definitely. So, <coughs> good thing is they'll be able to buy it on the open market very absolutely. soon. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I do think it's a stock that's going to go places. I remember, okay. meeting, remember very clearly meeting you Gordon two years ago and being excited about it and I continue to be excited about the space. Thank you. Um, so first question, um, you know, with school returning uh, back to face-to-face, -face, I mean, do you think this will affect uh, Edufocal's financial performance? So that's a great question, Dan, and one that has been asked before. And I'll say this, right? A lot of people talk about our jump in revenue from 26 to 102 million, but nobody talks about the jump from 12 to 26, right? Um, still a relatively small number, but the point is we were actually doing sales in schools before the pandemic. Edufocal is not a pandemic company. We've been around prior to the pandemic, and we were growing before the pandemic. We have relationships with over 100 schools, and I'm happy to see that schools are open. The Ministry of Education is a key partner of Edifocal, um, and the minister herself spoke about um, you know, learning loss and the, the hundreds of thousands of students that will need support um, you know, over the next couple of years. You know, we are a key partner for the ministry. The ministry is a key partner for us, and you know, we will continue our relationship with the ministry. Uh, in fact, we are about to um, enter into conversation with the ministry about you know, some work around dealing with that learning loss. You know, I'm excited about that, that prospect and we'll share more about that in the near future. Um, but also, one of the challenges we had when we were doing sales in schools, because we actually would have sales reps visiting schools, and one of the challenges we had is that we would print scratch off, scratch off cards. They would be sold in the schools, and then what would happen is that we'd have to be collecting. It wasn't an efficient process. Um, but if you look at even the MJE portfolio and the companies in that MJE portfolio, there are a lot of potential collaborations that we can do through Mayberry, right? Um, and it really gives us access to a number of opportunities in terms of distribution, right? Um, so there are a lot of possibilities there, and we continue to work with the Mayberry team, work with the schools um, to grow sales in that area. But certainly will not, in my opinion, act as a negative force um, in terms of schools reopening. Excellent. Second one for me. Uh most investors are more familiar with the learning division. Can you tell us a bit more about Edifocal's business segment? So Chris, Chris Berry made a tweet, I think, a day ago, and he spoke about the fact that, you know, well, I actually thanked him for, you know, his role in getting Edifocal here, you know, and other people chimed in. And one of the things that he said was, you know, Mayberry has a robust training program for its sales advisors. Now, I want people to think about our business division from this perspective. Every company does onboarding, every company does training, even if it is done informally. Yep. We are largely focused on companies 
um, medium-sized and large companies. And if you look at a Mayberry, for example, we could potentially collaborate with Mayberry to take their training program, make it even more interactive, have it on our platform, and potential reps or current reps or anybody in the company can use that content to upskill themselves, right? Mayberry, in fact, could even start the Mayberry Academy or the Mayberry University, and that could be powered by Edufocal. So for the business division, we've worked with a number of companies. We've worked with Heart Trust, NTA, Jane Bank. I mean, a number of entities, you know, we've worked with, and, you know, that division, in my opinion, has a lot of scale, a lot of opportunity for growth, and we were very, very excited about, you know, where that division is going. Sounds good to me. <coughs> One more question to me, and then I'll go over to Gary. So get ready, Gary. Uh, last year, Edufocal was ranked in the top 100 most innovative ed tech companies in the Latin region. Mm -hmm. How significant was this for the company? So I was reading an Economist article about two weeks ago, and you know, it was talking about the, the massive growth of ed tech globally. Yeah. And that Economist article cited Whole and IQ. Whole and IQ is an authority when it comes to measuring the growth of um, ed tech companies around the world and they reached out to us and for this region after doing their, their research, it, you know, it, it turned out that we are one of the top 100 um, ed tech companies in Latin America and the Caribbean. So it was a great ach um, achievement for us on the heels of our listing at the time. You know, we're about to list. So that's something that I think we should be talking more about and shouting from the mountaintops because that is a big accomplishment and really affirms the work that we've been doing. Excellent. Sounds good. <coughs> Gary, over to you. Do you have any questions for Gordon? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on hold it for a quick second. But just, just, just one or two at this moment. Just, Gary, <laughs> just one or two. Hey, hey, um, I want to start first by congratulating you. Um, you know, because we give a lot of advice to business owners. Not all of them listen. And um, I think where you started from and where you are now is cheese to chop. And I think it's important to let everybody know that we really appreciate that, you know, you took the time to, you know, not only reach out to us, but to listen to some of the stuff. Some of it, you know, you, you, you weren't too excited about. Um, but, you know, thankfully, you know, the Lord has blessed us and you're not reaping the fruits from that. So congrats to you and your team. Um, my question is pretty simply, how do you continue this phenomenal growth? Is it possible? And if it is, explain so, great question, Gary. So, we've been operating in a way that has largely not been efficient, right? If you, if you take a look at our, um, our balance sheet, you look at our short-term debt, you look at financing costs, um, because of the kind of company that we are, our balance sheet is largely um, full of intangibles. Now, that's not a negative in a, in a, in a broad way, because if you think about the possibility for growth, we can still stay in our current range of, in, in, range of investment, push customer acquisition and business development and sales, and far outpace the growth that we've had in the past. What has been one of the you know, things that has been holding us back, actually, is our financing costs. So uh, if you look at the p and and you look at the financing costs, you take that out, right? Our net income would be much larger. So just by virtue of listing on the stock exchange, having access to the, to the ability to not um, pay income tax for five years, and another five years, it's half, um, but also benefiting from lower financing costs. In fact, a, a listed edufocal is an edufocal with next to no debt, a significant amount of cash on the balance sheet, and that will allow us to do the things that we've been doing just at a, you know, a much faster pace and a much, at a much more efficient pace. We will also have the ability and opportunity to attract even more talent to grow the company, uh, you know, both in the business division, but also in the learning division. You know, a lot of people have spoken about us as a PEP company, but Edifocal actually is an ed tech company that facilitates the preparation for the PEP exam currently, at least on the learn side. But the possibilities are endless in terms of the breadth and scope of things that we can do. We can facilitate CSEC, we can facilitate SATs, we can facilitate the SEA in Trinidad, right? There are many possibilities for Edufocal and for growth. And you know, I'm personally very excited about the things that we will do post-listing. Um, and again, you know, we're just looking to delight our, our investors. Sounds good. 
screen. We lost Gary. No, no, I think he's still there. No, no, I'm here. Okay. Oh, I don't know if I should ask again. You all told me I must keep my question. I, I said one or two. Go right ahead with your second one. Ah, okay. All right, all right, fine. No problem. Um, you know, speak about the market potential outside of Jamaica. Um, obviously, there is significant growth here. Um, but is this something that is scalable outside of Jamaica? Absolutely. So, look at it this way, Gary. Vocational development in Jamaica is a massive undertaking, right? Many of our nurses, for example, are looking to prepare for exams that lead them outside of Jamaica. But that exam that these Jamaican nurses take are not limited to just Jamaican nurses. Any nurse on earth that is looking to settle in the U.S. to practice as a nurse, they need to take this exam to enter the U.S. So you can understand the scope and scale, for example, of us you know, potentially preparing Jamaican nurses for an exam to enter into the United States. Not saying that we're doing that right now, not yep. saying that's something that we're focused on, but just giving you an example of or you know, areas that we could potentially look at to scale. Do you have any examples in the business to business space that you would want to refer to? Any recent in the last six months a year? Yeah. Or are you looking to any recent industries or particular persons you've signed with to help solidify the example of doing this sort of yeah. business to business learning, education, certification, et cetera? So most of the opportunities that we're looking at right now, Dan, are actually local. Okay. Um, but we are looking at opportunities outside of Jamaica in terms of potential to bring in you know, foreign exchange, you know, but also developing content that we can leverage across the region and internationally. Uh, but we'll be speaking about that at a later date. Got it, got it. But, but certainly, they're, they're going to be, you mentioned, certifications for various businesses and so on. So that's Absolutely. definitely something Absolutely. you're actively pursuing. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I'm sure in short order, you'll be able to tell us Absolutely. a bit more about yeah. new Absolutely. contracts and successes you've achieved yeah. in that space. Absolutely. How do you market and push innovation when a large number of Jamaicans still believe in traditional methods? So when we started EduFocal in 2012, our debt to GDP ratio was about 160. Um, I, I heard the finance minister said, said yesterday that we're going to be about under 60% soon. Five years. Um, yeah. Five years. We had Claro. Yes. Um, 12 years, um, in 2012, when we launched, we had Claro as one of our networks. And we were really just getting onto the 56 um, kbps stage of the internet. Um, again, I share this to contextualize the environment that we started in. Yep. And a lot of people telling us that what we're doing can't work and the environment that we're in now. Not necessarily an ideal environment, but where people, how we're thinking about progress has changed completely. I mean, uh -huh. I mean the finance minister in his opening budget presentation yesterday spoke about you know, digitizing currency. You know, those initiatives potentially have huge upsides for companies like, like Eddie Fuqua. Not necessarily in the next year or two years, but potentially in the medium to long term. Explain that. Have you had problems in the past because of payment methods or, oh, or something like that? So, so, so that's something we spoke about earlier where, you know, we did sales in schools simply because, you know, Jamaica's internet penetration, Jamaica's access to credit cards to purchase online was less than stellar. But I can tell you that the numbers are looking much better now um, in terms of what we see our online sales to be. And again, we are in talks about potentially setting up distribution points for people to purchase Edufocal um, with a potential partner. Again, something that we'll announce right, in right, the near right. future. Sounds like lots of announcements, <laughs> announcements to come. Absolutely. I, I look forward to it. Uh, does Edufocal plan to eventually support secondary and tertiary <laughs> institutions as well? And I think you commented on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. We, you know, we do plan to, to, to look at um, those sectors in, in the medium to, short to medium term. Yep. Good deal. And similarly, international qualifications. I guess you spoke about the nurses. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sounds good to me. Uh, Gary, any, anything else from you? Yeah, um, I'm still on the growth story. You know, um, people tend to think of Edifocal as just, you know, one of the better words, as you said, Pep High School. Um, speak to us about expanding outside of that, you know, adult learning. Um, you, you made reference to like nurses, but also um, companies. You, know, you spoke on it, go to the neighbor in his university. Um, is, can this learning platform be extended, you know, just into halls of learning, wherever somebody wants to learn something, can they come to a platform at any forum? Great question, Gary, and that's exactly what we've been building at EduFocal over the last 10 years. We built a platform that will allow us to scale and do things that, you know, we would not have been possible without the investments we've been making in our platform. So that is something 
again, that we're excited about. I wish I could talk about it a little bit more. I can't. Um, but, you know, let's just say that I'm, I'm happy to be a, an educational shareholder, and I'm happy that, you know, a number of Jamaicans got the opportunity to invest in the company at this growth stage. Because that's really where we are. We're at the growth stage. We're shifting from the startup phase to the growth phase. Um, Gary, you'll recall that one of the conversations we had in the early days was the fact that you were pushing me to get a, a CFO. Because we did not have a CFO. Now we have a, 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 an amazing CFO, um, you know, in Kayon Haynes Burke. And we're really looking forward to refining a lot of our processes and just really pushing um, for more growth. Um, so I think that what we've accomplished so far over the last five years has been phenomenal. But what we will do in the next five will really make the, you know, the last five years look as if you know, we weren't even trying, in my opinion. So, what I, I mean, with 100 million in revenues, what you're saying is, I mean, the sky's the limit. This could easily be $500 million, a billion dollars. It could dollars be a billion dollars. In five years' time. Yeah. The, the market has that much capacity. Correct. Uh, and and I, not just the local market. No, no, absolutely. Regionally uh, and internationally. Because if you think about expansion funded you focal and compare it to a traditional company, Dan, which are most of the companies on the stock exchange, they require machinery, they require, you know, all kinds of Brick and mortar sometimes. Brick and mortar to yeah. scale. We don't. Yeah, yeah. We are exporting intellectual property. Right. Right? So, again, you know, that is what I'm excited about, um, and that is what we've been investing in, um, and our investors will see the return of that, in my opinion, over the next um, couple of quarters. Yeah, I, I really do believe, truly, that the business is, is very scalable, and you talk about having served 100,000 parents Correct. already, and I think of my, my own children, to be mm -hmm. quite frank, when they were going to high school, there were only two or three options that could satisfy me, yeah. and then we always had the additional yeah. learning that we would access, however we would access it, and yeah. I think as long as you guys offer a quality service and product, people will you know, really want to get it yeah. uh, for their kids, for themselves, et cetera. So oh, I think... Yeah, one part of the business that we have um, to Dan is called Edifocal Academy. It's Jamaica's first full-time online school. And it's something that is still in its early stage, but we make big bets. Um, the school has now 50 full-time students. Um, and you know, I was on the road today, and somebody came up to me, and she said, you know, Gordon, I have a nine-year-old. I don't know this person. I yeah. have a nine-year-old. Schools are reopened physically, but I want to send my child to your, to your online school. So again, I think that we're seeing the genesis of a shift in how we think about learning. And I'm excited that EduFocal is playing a key part in that, so both in Jamaica who, and elsewhere. Somebody who wanted to homeschool could essentially outsource that correct, to you. Correct, correct, correct. Organizations that want to do training can also outsource it to us on the business side. Yeah. I could see financial sector folks who want to do their ML, correct, AML correct. Uh, accreditation, um, annual stuff. You know, manufacturing companies that want to keep their HACCP certification. Mm -hmm. Again, the possibilities are endless. Yep, I agree with yeah. that. Good deal. Okay, folks, remember to send in your questions uh, through social media, and we'll be happy to entertain them where we can. And uh, Gordon, you know, I do hope within the next two weeks we'll see the company listing. You will have 2,400 approximate new shareholders mm -hmm. who all have made the leap of faith. And listen, again, if we didn't have a very tight distribution, <laughs> I had NCB, I had Sajikor, I had VM, I had Burrito all knocking at the door saying, let me in, let me in, let me in. And I had yeah. to say, guys, we can't let you in because, you know, I, I really d didn't want to end IPO. up. Yeah, I didn't want to end up with, you know, 1 billion, 1 1.5 billion. But who knows, they might have other opportunities in the future. Uh, absolutely, I'm yeah. sure they will. There, there are going to be lots of listings this yeah. year, uh, but, but I think yours is one that excites me. First question that I see coming in, and I, I think we should have time to do two or three guys, maybe not a whole lot more. So I'm going to just take them in order of the, the questions that came in, and I apologize for those that we didn't get. First one coming in is from Troyan Browning, and Gordon, that's for you. He says, how would you describe your 2022 20, and 23 projections for the company? Is it moderate, moderate, conservative, or aggressive? And then he asks, how many students does the academy have? And I think you just mentioned yeah, what the academy 50. has. But how do you feel about those projections? Um, so so every, every CEO is going to be bullish about their, their projections. Yep. Um, I will say that I am very, very, very optimistic about our numbers, and I think that we can more than hit them um, if we make the right decisions this year, which we are doing, if we invest in the things that we need to invest, to, um, invest in, we certainly will see the return on it. I think that we've started the year on a good footing, um, i.e. 2020, 2022. 
Um, but yeah, I'm very confident and optimistic about hitting our 2022 and 2023 numbers, both top line and bottom line. Good deal. And, and again, coming out of this uh, IPO, all of that money is going into the company. None, right. There's no selling shareholder. Yeah, there's no selling shareholder. <laughs> Absolutely and, not. And I mean, that's going to be the majority of it's being used to pay down debt or to right. create working capital for you to grow the business. So you're very focused on trying to grow the business. That's what your focus is. Great. Another one from Blue Collar Finance, and it says your ARPU increased by over 300% in 2021. Uh, did your business to business or uh, new line of business cause this increase? So basically, the B2B segment definitely contributed to it. Um, I mean, we plan to kind of share more around ARPU in the near future. Um, but yes, the short answer is yes, it did contribute to it. Yeah. Great, great. And, and that's definitely one of the things we want to focus on yes. going forward. Absolutely. And as you said again, by going public, it increases the visibility of the company. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, I mean, not only for opportunities locally, but again, regionally and internationally. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, it certainly makes the world a difference when you're approaching folks and yeah. you, you can say, hey, I, right, I'm open book, publicly listed company. Right. Uh, good line of bankers. You have a fantastic board, by the way, Gordon. I don't Thank know you. how you convince, convince <laughs> so many. Uh, luminaires to join your board, yeah, uh, you. including your chairman, yeah, Peter Levy, Peter Levy, uh, yeah. who's been with the business for, yeah. for some time, for ten years, and personally is invested. Correct. And again, wants made it, more. Made it very clear that he's not yeah. he's not trying to sell. He's, yeah. he's trying to watch the business grow a little bit yeah. more. We do have a question in from our chairman Barry, who apologizes for not being here, and he says, "Can you say what your next major project will be?" Uh, sorry, uh, chair. Barry, I mean, we can't speak about uh, our major projects right now, but we do have m many major projects, not just one. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that would take the entire forum just to discuss what we, um, what we have in mind. But definitely, over the next um, couple of weeks, possibly months, we will be sharing a little bit more about what we have in mind, or what it is that we've been working on. Good deal. And, and, and I know there are lots of possibilities. Again, you have Absolutely. cash, you, you have access to, you access will have to access to, to cheaper financing, yeah. you have access to cash. So who knows, even an acquisition could be a possibility. Anything is possible. A anything yeah. is possible. Any anything is possible. I, I appreciate that. Okay, well, well, thanks for that, Gordon. We really do appreciate that. Uh, okay, moving along, I don't see any more questions. Um, I think we're gonna move on into our top stock uh, picks and our review for this week. Good deal. First up, I think we're going to be reviewing Grace Kennedy, which is one of our top 10 picks for this year. And it's great to see the results coming out from GK. If I could, oh, we're gonna, let's do Pan Jam first. Good deal. Okay, so Pan Jam, great company, yeah, one of the 10 largest um, companies by market capitalization on the stock market. And we can see that they're having a great year. They just uh, posted their results for 2021 and you can see 100% increase in profitability from 3.5 billion to 7.2 billion. But let's just talk a little bit about how they, they got there. I mean, first of all, we see um, the improvement in their income from investments, and this speaks to their roughly $9.5 billion uh, portfolio of investments, which gave them an investment return of $2 billion. So we're seeing the markets coming back. Last year, they lost $500 million on their portfolio. You know, obviously, COVID and its impact on the valuation of their portfolio um, uh, traded stocks mainly. And this year, we see them making a $2 billion gain. So that's the first significant improvement is sort of a two and a half billion dollar turnaround. We see the property size of the business being very steady and Pan Jam has over $10 billion in investment um, properties, giving them a steady top line return of about 20%. So we can see the income from there being consistent at 2.1 billion. So it's good to see that in the COVID environment that didn't have to give huge discounts in relation to their property rentals and income that they're earning from their um, investment properties. And so that's good steady line. You, you typically see that with Pan Jam, that they're consistently earning about $2 billion there. Typically, the growth in the portfolio also does well, but they had some challenges in COVID. 
and then next you can't read the same slide, sorry guys. You, you can't read Pan Jam's profitability without looking to their profit from associated companies, uh, primarily Sagicor. So you, you can't read Pan Jam without reading Sagicor. And you can see here that they made $5.4 billion, up by about a billion dollars or 40% in profit from associated companies of that 5.4. 5.2 is coming directly from Sagicor with the, the profitability from their 30% interest in Sagicor being about $4.1 billion in the year before. So their share of the Sagicor profits improved by over $1.1 billion um, year over year. So obviously Sagicor is doing much better. When Sagicor does well, Pan Jam does well because you know, Pan Jam is essentially the second largest shareholder in Sagicor group owning 30.2% of it. So interestingly, we see the asset base of Pan Jam also growing impressively um, and the, to $67 billion. Um, again, of that $67 billion, their investment in Sagicor alone is carried at cost of $36 billion. But the market value of their Sagicor investments, which they don't carry at market value, they carry at cost, is $68 billion when you dive into their audited financial statements. So there's $30 billion of unrealized gains in a relation to their investment in Sagicor. So when you try to read Pan Jam, I'm often thinking, is it a PE stock? You know, why is it trading at 10 times PE at today's $6 or $7? Or is it a fund? Should it be trading closer to its NAV? And here it says its price to book is 1.4 times, which means the market value is $74 billion relative to the total assets of $67 billion, total net assets. But yet I just described the fact that they have $30 billion in total net assets not recognized from the Pan Jam investment. So again, uh, price to book is more like one time when you make the adjustment for the fact that they're not carrying the Sagicor at its true market value. So it's a great company, uh, whether you want to look at it from a PE or a price to book perspective, I think they're poised for, for growth. Again, a lot of it will be tied to Sagicor, so make sure you guys study Sagicor pretty well, but it's still a great company. They're doing a great job there. We've seen a changing of the guard in the form of Joanna E. Banks coming in now, and Stephen Facey's obviously setting to step back. Uh, I think it's a great company. I think they're going to do exceptionally well going forward. Uh, next slide, you see the sort of growth in uh, profitability quarter by quarter. Again, they had some challenges throughout COVID and Q1, Q2, but since then, they're doing $2.4 billion per quarter. Final slide, you can see the share price. Um, the share price has been relatively flat for the last couple of months. On the next slide, guys, you can see that the share price has been relatively flat. And um, some ups and downs. But this is a stock that I think we're going to come back in a year's time and see that this value would have increased by 25 30%. So one I definitely like. Uh, Gary, any thoughts on Pan Jam? Gary, any thoughts from you on Pan Jam? Yeah, are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Yeah, I think the key point, you've raised it. Um, they're carrying an investment at cost. And when you value that market value, which you could argue it should be, um, you know, the, the value of the company is significantly higher than what you've seen on the balance sheet. And it's a company, I think, as we come out of COVID, and also because there's such a huge investment in Sagicor, and I don't think we have started to see the potential of Sagicor as yet. Um, so I think the upside for Sagicor is huge. Um, Panjam will benefit from that. And then also they have a nice package of investments as it's growing. You know, so I agree with you. I think it's a conundrum. Um, investors aren't sure how to value the stock, whether to value it based on net asset value or as an EPS stock. Um, but in the meantime, it's, it's, it's value that's there for a smart investor to benefit from. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Gary. Appreciate that. And then next up is GK uh, Financials, and they also just released their audited financials for the full year, uh, December 2021. And similarly here, we're seeing huge growth in their bottom line. They've just grown their profits by 32%. But again, walking you through that, first up, we see 12% uh, growth in revenues, uh, revenues uh, getting up to $129 billion uh, and, you know, roughly $14, $15 billion growth. And for the first time, I'm seeing their food and trade division actually topping $100 billion. So four years ago, we were talking about Grace topping $100 billion in total. And now their food and trading division alone has just topped 
100 billion dollars for the first time, 101 billion dollars, uh, which represented about 14 percent growth. Um, today, that represents about 75 percent of their total sales. No change there. It's still prior year it represented about 75 percent. Still does. So most of the growth coming from the food and trading division. And then uh, that sort of just flows right down through to the bottom line. So when we talk about sales growing by 32%, profitability growing by 32% to $8.9 billion, again, the food division makes up about 75% of that total profitability as well, too. So it's good to see uh, them making good money in the food business. It's 75% you know, of what they do. Uh, they have other lines of business, of course, but, but, but most of this is, is coming from the food business. The only other segment that's very profitable uh, would be the remittance business, which also did very well. But most of the growth, which is good to see, uh, has come from the food, food and distribution business. And so now we see the EPS growing to $8.23. That's 32% growth. The stock, even at $103, is trading only at a 12 and a half times PE in a market where we like to think of 14 times as being about par. So I still think you know, the stock's a little bit undervalued relative to the market. And for the size market cap, $102 billion. Again, there are you know, literally only six or seven companies uh, on the market keeping company with them in this kind of space, topping $100 billion in market cap. And th this is one of the few ones that's trading at a relatively low PE for the size. And given the fact that they're showing consistent growth in sales over the last three, four years, and now growth in profitability, you have to think to yourself that this is a good one to have in your portfolio. It's a company that's been around for 100 years, and I think we're going to come back in another 100 years, and it's still going to be there, still going to be growing. More than 50% of their profits are now being made from outside of Jamaica, and they are really uh, you know, kicking. They're expanding in North America, and UK, Europe, and it's just a strong brand, Grace Kenny, that it's, it's hard not to love this stock. Next slide, you want to talk about looking at the quarterly growth and profitability. Just look at the last four quarters. I mean, quarter on quarter on quarter on quarter growth. I mean, this is the type of scale that you want to see. And I think, you know, they're going to just continue growing this business. They got $30 billion in cash, $40 billion in investments. Um, th there's no doubt that they're going to put some of that cash to work. Uh, Don is clearly on a growth strategy. He's created a team to focus on M&A activity. And I think uh, that team is going to reward the shareholders handsomely over the next uh, two, three years. And then last slide here shows the share price. It tends to you know, not move for relatively long periods of time, and then it jumps. This is sort of the history of GK over the last four years that I've watched this stock. I bought the stock at $48, you know, four years ago and after a year I was you know, wondering, you know, what did I do? Why is it moving so slow? And then, you know, doesn't move for like two years and then it gives you a pop and then doesn't move for a year and then it gives you a pop. And so now at $100, I still think it's undervalued by 15, 20% plus they're growing the business. So I think again, we're gonna come back in a year's time and this stock is gonna be 25, 30% higher. Uh, you can't lose when you're talking about buying a stock in good volume. You want to make a $10 million investment or a $20 million investment. You can't often do that with the junior market companies, quite frankly, because they don't have the liquidity. But here's one where you can buy $30 million of grace, put it down, and in three, four years' time when you want to sell it, that's not even you know, four or five days of trading for GK. It's a great stock to have as your portfolio gets big. So when you look at their top 10, all of the big pension funds typically will buy GK. It's clearly one of the blue chips. It's a great company with great potential um, from my point of view. Again, Gary, uh, you, you want to share any thoughts you may have on GK? Yeah, um, I, I was listening to their webinar today, their investor webinar. You know, and, and Don, Don had to be going through his selection of words. You know, he's trying not to say exceptional, great, very good. You know, it, it was great. And I think the best thing about the numbers last year is that the profit growth actually was higher than the revenue growth. So what that's saying is that they're growing the top line, but they're also benefiting from significant efficiencies in the business. You know, so they're, be, they're able to eco more profit on a relatively lower revenue, revenue base. So 
that I thought was, was, was pretty good. And so you, I think that's a benefit of COVID and they had to learn how to do things more different, how to do things differently and they've succeeded. You know, you, you've heard of the strategic, um, the strategic philosophy of red and blue ocean. I think right now, Grace Kennedy has found a deep, deep blue ocean. And, you know, their products are just being loved right across the world in different markets. And I think that's what's driving the food business. And as the markets get more and more comfortable with the products that Grace is selling and selling in those markets, I think you're going to con see consistent top line double, um, double digit revenue increases. And with continuing efficiencies, um, that's going to translate in a lot of profit. So I don't think it's a stop just to look at it in terms of what the PE is now. I think that EPS is going to continue to grow in double digits. Gary, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's, again, what makes it one of our top 10 picks here at Mayberry. OK, great, guys. Uh, moving on, I want to look at the top decliners and gainers for the week, starting with the decliners first, if you, if you will. OK, first up, KLE down by approximately 20%. ISP Finance down by 12.2%. FESCO down by 12% at a valuation that I can't figure out, quite frankly. MTL down at 10.6%. And finally, Key Insurance down by 9.73%. Moving on, for the top gainers for this week, we have Cargo Handlers Limited up by 18%. Everything Fresh up by 13%. Uh, PGX up by 10%, Portland. Uh, Paramount Trading up by 9.58%. And First Rock, their US dollar share price up by 9.44%. Okay, moving on to our last segment of the evening. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about foreign exchange. And Gary, uh, we've got your favorite slide here that shows what's going on with the FX up and down, up and down. Year to date, we actually see you now a small revaluation, guys, on the next slide here. I believe the dollar's revalued by about 0.4% year to date. So this is pretty interesting. I panicked a little bit when it was at 158. I'm not going to tell a lie, Gary. Uh, what's going on with the market, Gary? What are your thoughts? What, what should we expect? Well, as you, as you remember, I mentioned about two weeks um, when we saw what the graph was doing, it was getting to an inflection point. And I was of the view that it would break to the upside, which would mean that it would devalue some more. Um, but then what we saw were some extraordinary measures. Um, the Bank of Jamaica sold a ton load of US into the system. And then even after that, they've come out with a directive whereby, you know, there's a there's, there's a suspension of the issuance of US securities. So I think what that did, it sent a very clear signal to the market that they thought that the, the, where the dollar was trading was obviously a bit too high. And you've seen where the graph has started to pull back in terms of a revaluation. Um, we believe that this is the whole, the whole inflation argument, you know, because if the dollar is appreciating, it kind of brings on the cost of that imported good. Um, but from my perspective, again, I think in another month or so, you're going to see a value, a value being created. Um, so I think now is a good time to start adding to your US dollar position. Um, because the rate of 154, I think, is pretty good against the, against the fact that you had 8% 8 8 inflation last year. Um, we still have, we're going to have inflationary pressures this year. I mean, when you look at where the price of oil is. So, you know, in, in the portfolio, you know, if you were to start adding, I think that's something you should really take a look at. I expect it to continue trending down, meaning appreciate some more, um, probably for the next week or so. But at some point, I think you're going to see demand coming back into the market. And we expect the dollar to base and probably turn at that point. Good deal. Yep, and you're correct. You, 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 you caught the fact that the BOJ and FSC have basically said they want to suspend for the next six months any new U.S. dollar issuances on, under the exempt distribution regime. We saw the BOJ increasing the overnight interest rate by a significant amount, 150 basis points increase. Uh, so they've taken out their big bat. They've got a large uh, level of NIR, and, and, and we see the dollar revaluing. We see them selling into the market as well. And so it seems to be having some short-term impact. But then we got, you know, crazy man Putin and its impact on uh, oil prices. We see oil prices jumping significantly. Jamaica, we know, does not have a hedge in place. I, I, I see JPS immediately signaling you're going to have to expect increases in your your electricity rates in, in the next month or two. 
but on the flip side, we see uh, Minister Clark putting out a budget, no, no new taxes. Uh, government seems confident in its budget numbers. Um, I, I hope they've contemplated the increase in oil prices. Uh, they're still on their trajectory to try to keep reducing the debt to GDP ratio each year. And as Gordon uh, mentioned earlier, with that target of getting down to 60%. So lots of pushing and pulling, ups and downs. Uh, and I think we're seeing it in this, this curve here. Uh, for the exchange rate. And then now I think hopefully we're in the peak of the tourism season, um, which will start to taper off in the next two months, but a lot of those U.S. dollar flows will start to come in. And then lastly, Gary, I think we're going to see the economy opening up fully. I mean, there's, there's no doubt to me that, you know, COVID is quickly becoming a thing of a past, knock on wood. And we really look forward to seeing the curfews fully removed. Um, I think the science of it now suggests clearly the positivity rate has been trending down for the last two, three weeks. We're well below 5%. Um, and, and it really is time to get back to business. We see all of these businesses. We just looked at two, two very large top 10 companies by market cap who both struggled in the COVID year because of the impact of the COVID and government measures and its impact on the financial markets. Both companies were impacted to some extent. Panjam certainly more than GK, but both were impacted to some extent. So there are tens of thousands of small businesses that have really struggled over the last year. Um, and I would guess 20% of Jamaicans who depend on entertainment, nightlife, uh, to survive, you know, and, 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 and so we really look forward to seeing uh, this coming back. Uh, another positive push is the increase in minimum wage. And so we really hope they'll all come together uh, to grow the economy. Um, but we do have to watch out for inflation. That one is definitely going to be, you know, pretty challenging again for this year, I'd say, Gary. Okay. Uh, any last comments or thoughts from you, Gary? Um, on a foreign exchange, as I said, you know, um, it can it can appreciate some more, but I think when you look on when you look on where it is relative to where it was last year, I think it's a good opportunity to start to buy U.S. Um, you know, because I don't see how much lower it can go from here, and you know, we're see, we're seeing extraordinary measures, you know, in the marketplace now in the sense of the suspension of U.S. securities. And the Bank of Jamaica is saying, listen, you know, we are, we are monitoring the demand and, you know, wherever we can taper the demand, which sends a signal that, you know, they, they, would, they, they want to see the dollar at a, at a lower level. Um, you know, the, the, the budget indicated that, you know, no new taxes, but that's just no new categories of taxes. Um, taxes are going to increase, but um, because that's done pretty well over time. But the important thing is that the minister is squarely focused on reducing our debt to GDP. And that's what that, that usual 10 to 15% increase in taxes now is used to do. And as that debt to GDP, GDP comes down, um, it expands the capacity um, of the economy to do, to do a whole lot better. And to close, you know, when oil is going above 100, I think it's north of 135 now, um, that, you know, it, it, you know, we need to ask the question about alternative energy. You know, the full disclosure, we're investing in Wigton, but, you know, is it no time for an RFP to come out to add to the, the energy grid? You know, because we don't produce oil. And even if we had a hedge, the cost of the hedges are very expensive. You know, so we really need to go deeper into alternative energy because that's, that's the only solution. The thing that we have that's sustainable is the sun. You know, so as, as they say, tap into the sun. You know, and the more we do that, the better it's, it's, it's going to be. But I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, our oil bill alone at $80 exceeds the total exports of the country, the oil bill alone. So we really do have to look to how we can reduce the cost of energy. I recall from four years ago, you know, at $80 a barrel, I was spending, you know, at JPS and my CFO capacity right. over six billion dollars a month was our fuel bills I, I can't imagine what the fuel bill is today yeah but but you know the, the good thing i mean i don't know if the right word is good the good thing is that you know it's, it, it it helps the fiscal because the sct on fuel 
it's going to be a huge tax number, you know, because as the price of fuel goes up, that percentage for SEC increases, you know. So what it does, it puts it puts the government in a position to do a lot more. And uh, it's an indirect tax. Um, at the end of the day, people determine, you know, how much gas they need to they need to operate. You know, so as I said, you know, there's a downside in terms of the pass through to, to the average your average economy, etc., cetera, and the small man. But on the flip side, you know, you see where there are more resources that will flow into government coffers. You know, I think the, the finance minister indicated that they're putting aside two billion dollars to 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 help with you know a certain a certain segment of the of the society, which I think is going to be sorely needed. You might very well find that he has to increase that. You know, because you know when you look on that percentage on that gas tax and where the cost of gas is now, you know that's huge, right? But as I said, the good thing, and this is one thing, the one thing you'll never forget about this finance minister, he is focused laser-like on reducing this debt, yeah? And this is a good opportunity for him to, to, to pay down a chunk of that. So, let's see. Absolutely, and hopefully as he continues to pay down debt, we'll see more liquidity available for the equities market, my favorite thing. And folks, if I have my way, we'll have no less than three more IPOs slash APOs for you in the coming months. We're going to be working at, hard at it. I think this year is going to be a record-breaking year in terms of IPOs, Gary. I think we're going to have at least eight IPOs in Jamaica in total. And I think maybe we'll have about three more if, if I can have my way. We've got quite a few in the pipeline working on folks. So uh, please look forward to it. Uh, we have Edge Focal we just produced for you. That's going to be a great one. Uh, buy it if you didn't get it at the uh, IPO. You can get it on the open market. Don't worry, it'll, it'll, it'll be available. So thanks, Gordon. Really appreciated having you here. To our viewers, thank you all for being a part of today's weekly investment forum. And I really want to give again a special thanks to our special guest, Gordon Swaby, for participating in the forum and for giving us a great IPO. We're certainly looking forward to having more insightful discussions in the future. Be sure to follow us on social media and to stay up to date with our live streams. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Mayberry Investments Limited. Thank you all, viewers, for tuning in today. And remember, keep safe, slow and steady wins the race. Bye-bye.